afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, meeting of the State Board of Elections. Um, I'll open the meeting as first the State Board of Canvassers because we have some amendments to our canvas that we certified back in December that have to be made. But before we start, I'm Peter Kaczynski. Uh, to my right is Douglas Kellner. To my left is Greg Peterson. And to my far right is Andy Spano, the four commissioners. Uh, we'll open as a board of canvassers to do the following amendments to the uh, 2019 certification. Uh, we, we received amended vote results from Dutchess County for the following contests, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Comptroller, Attorney General, U.S. Senate, State Supreme Court Justice, Congress, uh, Congress State Senate, Assembly. Uh, we also received amended blank results from Warren County for U.S. Senate and Congress. We have corrected formulas and totals votes by party and total votes by candidate for the following district, the 37th Senate District, and we have corrected vote results for Oneida County in the 101st Assembly District. So we have these documents before us to approve those amended certifications. If there is a motion to accept these, I'll so move. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So we will. Uh, amend the certifications to the, that effect. We have to sign just these, the just the last one page. page. Let me pull that out here. Um, Doug, we'll start with you here first. Okay, so that concludes the business at the State Board of Canvassers. I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn from the Board of Canvassers meeting. Second, all, all in favor? Aye. And we will now convene as the Board of Elections. And our first order of business are the minutes from December 14th, 2018. I assume all the commissioners have received them. Is there a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. Second. Second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So they are accepted. Um, we'll now go on to unit up updates, and we will begin with the executive unit, Bob Brem and Todd Valentine. Uh, we can continue to work on um, the budget was released with regards to the agency budget, and we'll continue to work with the division of budget uh, based upon our analysis. We'll pop into more details if you want. You know, prox we're approximately two hundred million dollars short for what we need to actually operate the agency. I'm sorry, Todd. How much was that? Approximately three million dollars short three. from what we need to operate the agency in the coming year. Uh, and that doesn't include that doesn't cover any of the costs of the additional programs which are included in the governor's budget or are in any of the legislation that's currently pending before the governor. So those still those items still have to be worked out. Uh, and there was no, so far there's been no additional cybersecurity money, uh, which we were anticipating based upon our discussions last year with budget to help with the county board mitigation program because of the large amount of the funds that we've already gotten between the federal and the state money was approximately $24 million. Based upon the programs we've already started and the procurements we put in place, We've allocated a very large portion of that money. There's about $4 million left uh, that's not planned to be, that we already haven't planned to be spent. So if there are not additional funds, we would have to revisit our plan. Um, so that will keep us busy. And, and we are, again, as I said, awaiting the governor to sign any of the new election reform bills. Uh, and how we're going to implement that is still an unknown. You know, it does put a lot of a burden on the Board of Elections here and the county boards to come up with plans on implementing uh, early voting, uh, the transfers of registration, uh, the 16-year-olds, the fourth one that I'm forgetting. LLC. Uh, the L and, and close the LLC as well. So uh, those still, we still need to come up with plans for implementing those, and they do work, they will require changes in regulation, so we'll have to draft those, agree them, uh, and bring them back to you for your approval at some point in the, probably this spring. So, 
So let's let's talk for just a minute about that. So let's talk about time frames as far as implementation of the programs that can I ask one before that Peter? Oh absolutely. Uh, only because of the three million why were we three million short? Well that's a good question. Uh, you know what we're looking at was there were monies that were not reappropriated that we believe should have been. Mm -hmm. um, so that encompasses that. I mean, there's always there's always a shortfall in the in the personal service money, mm -hmm. uh, typically, uh, and then it's usually covered by the, the non personal service funds. Um, but this is a little bit higher because of that, because it was funds that would have covered a lot of the staff for what we call H bits. They're the technology ba hourly based technology people that do a large number of the work for the Capus Fidus, the Nice Photo Program. Um, so their, their services are needed, so we would have to, if we don't get the funds, we'll have to figure out what it is we're going to have to stop doing because we're going to run out of money to pay them. Because no other pot to get the money from. Correct. Yeah, and without the additional federal funds, you know, while some of the work they do is cybersecurity related, mm -hmm. so certainly some could be moved to that. Um, a large chunk of it is related to funds that we provided to raise up the county cybersecurity level. So the program for intrusion detection uh, is is geared towards the county. That's a, a large chunk of money. What we call the managed security services, which is to look at the other logs that the county produced. Those are funds not for our support, but for supporting the county cybersecurity, which in, which does support us as well. If they're stronger, we're stronger. But you know, part of that doesn't even address some of the fixes that we know we will need to make in the coming year. While well, the counties have their work to do based upon the risk assessment, again, a cost we've undertaken for the counties. You know, we're going to get our own risk assessment done. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security is, is offered to do that for free. They're slightly delayed because of the government shutdown. But you know, we anticipate a series of items that we're going to have to undertake, to fix it, we're going to have to undertake. So we, it would be hard pressed for us to move those funds to cover something else. Well, the, here's this other need we've got to cover. No, I understand. So we, we, you know, Bob can go into far greater detail than I can. And we did provide the detail to the Division of Budget when we met with them earlier this week. Um, you know, they don't say yes or no. They just take in the information and see what happens in the 30-day amendments. Um, Thank you, and, and it's true with the, the programs that were included in the budget and certainly the ones that were not in the budget that were passed, uh, there, is, there is a fiscal implication to us, but again, we haven't calculated because we're it's still in its infancy figuring out what to do. Um, but who, who knows where the money's going to come from. So. Now, that's a big deal, it did. to be sure, and to have new programs coming in. Yes. Okay. That's, that was the case that we were making. Yes, I'm sure you're right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on the budget, yeah. I mean, certainly we always look at when the when the executive budget comes out. We were fortunate this year; only one reappropriate uh, is not in the budget. Um, it's for the technology money we received last year. The unspent portion is about eight hundred and fifty thousand of that money. Um, so whether it gets reapproved or a new approved, but we're still three million short. It's a, it's about one point five million of that is for staff, and the other half is roughly the contractual services um, for the hourly based people who do technology projects. Um, we went this week to budget and made our case on Tuesday, and. Um, and, and we're going to follow up in writing to those persons in the chamber that are our normal contacts as well as the fiscal committees just so that they all understand where we're at just as a baseline what do we need to implement the programs established before any of the new initiatives are added to the table um, and hopefully that will be received well the second item that we raised with budget is that there's no new appropriation of cyber money I think we we laid out for budget all of the commitments we've currently have in place to make the state election system infrastructure strong 
and what are we doing in order to make county infrastructure strong and there's really only four million left out of the state and federal fund so you know somewhere around 24 million 20 of its committed to one of the projects the secure election center or some of the other services we're doing to either make the state system strong or the county system strong it's it's not a lot for mitigation and there's not a lot for what will we uncover when the risk assessments are completed and we get that summary report of items that need to be fixed or when the federal government comes finally to do our risk assessment and gives us the list of things that needs to be fixed we kind of have an idea we've dedicated certain things that we think will need to be mitigated we've come up with an estimate but it's still an estimate and there's not a lot of wiggle room with only four million left so we're also going to follow up with uh, making the case to that same group of people um, why we think it's appropriate to have an additional appropriation of cyber money. So my goal is to, you know, we, we met as a group to make sure we were all on the same page inside the agency on our numbers, and now we're going to uh, communicate outside as to what our needs are and at least make the case during the budget why it's important to fund it. Um, so I think we're... I, you know, I thought it was a good meeting with budget, um, but again, they have a good poker face. Um, they didn't say no. Um, they at least accepted the information. They said they were going to digest it and come back to us with any questions. So, so I thought that at least it was a it was a pretty productive meeting. Uh, we don't currently have a depth secretary that we speak to because uh, our our last depth secretary was reassigned uh, to uh, an agency, um, and we haven't been introduced to the new person yet so we'll if that happens normally Todd and I would meet with that individual as an initial conversation so we can bring them up to speed on what our needs are so we'll certainly look forward to doing that one as soon as possible but for the budget it it certainly starting the process three million uh, in the whole needs um, we can hope for the 30-day amendments to address that okay any other questions? Okay. So on the, you were talking about the legislation. I, I just had a couple questions, I guess, about that. So the one bill that allows for statewide transfers. Mm -hmm. So if I move from Buffalo to Long Island, mm -hmm. I can vote in, in, in Long Island without re-registering. Um, and I guess I'd vote by affidavit ballot or something and then yeah, so there's a provision in the statute. I guess it, it, it's a 60-day start, right? Mm -hmm. For 60 days from when it's signed. And that hasn't been signed yet? Correct. Right. Okay. So it'll be 60 days from the date the governor signs the bill. And we have to promulgate rules and regs prior to that 60 days, I guess, to implement this. Is that correct, the way I'm reading this? Okay. So we have a shorter window even than the 60 days to get some rules and regs out to the boards about how they're going to implement the statewide transferring process, which we currently don't have. So have we thoughts about that? Have we, is there something on the table about how to implement that to allow people to do that and the boards to hand? Because that's going to come up, I guess, at the June primary, right? So the first time this will be used, is that correct? Is that the June primary? Yes. It will be an effect in the June primary. Okay. So, I mean, is there a... <clears throat> plan is there a process is there something in the works as far as how we're going to actually tell the counties they should implement this to make sure that people are i guess there's a number of issues where they that they can't vote twice that you can't move and vote where your old address was and also vote with your new address are there thoughts on that I mean, there are thoughts we haven't met on it and i certainly haven't seen any written drafts or plans from from Bob or, or I don't know if Brian has them and, and turned them with Kim I haven't seen those though so um, you know certainly we were not I was not a party to the drafting of the legislation so and, and nobody on our side was so uh, if there was a plan with that in the back of their mind certainly putting in that effective date will make it challenging uh, I, I think you so hopefully I mean, I don't know, Bob, if you had any ideas on that? Well, certainly all of the bills allow us to do regulations to the extent we need regulations, but transferring records is not un 
unlike um, transferring within a county. So the question is, how can we make data available to the counties? So we've talked briefly, um, Todd and I, briefly, briefly. about um, what could we do under NICE voter to make it, because that's a, certainly the statewide database is um, available in every county and everybody in a board of elections has the ability to see all of the voter records throughout the state. The only one issue is we put a watermark on your signature, uh, counties would certainly need to see your unblemished signature, I guess, um, if not non-watermarked um, signature, but that would be a question of meeting with our IT people and figure out how can we make a report available to counties yeah. uh, now so that they can at least have information uh, on that kind of, you know, they certainly can see your, your your voter record uh, as it relates to transferring voter to within a county. The, the secondary issue is the vote issues. Um, how do we accommodate um, uh, the affidavit voting uh, as to whether or not they voted twice, but those are two issues. One is, is it a regulation, or if they do vote twice, is it a crime? Um, so at which point do we do the regulation around? But we'd certainly have to sit and review them, just like we'd have to review all of them. I think LLC has a seven-day effective date, so I don't know if we do them. I mean, certainly we have to look at them in which one do we have to do, which one's immediate, which one's seven days, which one's 60 days. Ideally, the pre-registration of 16-year-olds is next January. Mm -hmm. So that we have a little bit more time on. Um, well, I guess that's why I'm focused on this one is the relatively short implementation time frame that they gave us. The 60-day window is relatively short compared to some of the other provisions. So I, that's I certainly why I think it's work, that. and we will. I know we, we've been on a number of items, mostly since the budget came out. Um, we've worked on the calendar, which we know is like an immediate need that people will have if we do the uniform primary to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we can issue a calendar as quickly as possible. So we've tried to focus on perhaps not every one of them, but those which we saw immediately in our face. Um, but certainly we would have to focus next, especially if the governor signs them, um, to be able to implement them. Well, I mean, it just seems to me this one is a more significant change in the sense of administrative processes that will have to be undertaken than, say, the LLC or even the 16-year-old, which to me are not administratively as difficult because you can Im implement those without a lot of changes. But this one changes the very structure that we currently use for allowing people to transfer. Right now it's in county, now it'll be in state. So if I move from, let's say, Buffalo to, I guess anywhere, uh, Rochester, <coughs> um, the Erie County Board will have my record. I will come into the Monroe County Board and vote. I guess by, it would have the affidavit because I haven't registered there. So I vote affidavit. And then the Monroe County Board has to know, well, did you vote in Erie? Because if you voted in Erie, you shouldn't have voted in Monroe. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's, in, it's internal. So I know if you moved within my own county because I have your records all well, I know you voted me. in Monroe. I have your affidavit. No, but I'm saying I'm saying the current situation is if you move within county, you can do that. But I know about it because I'm in, I'm, I'm I control the records now. I don't control the records. Peter, we already have that system in place in New York City, where if you move across borough lines, and while it technically the city board of elections is one unit, the boroughs, with respect to processing. Uh, transfers of registration um, that uh, come by affidavit ballot on election day um, have procedures that are already in place and that would easily apply statewide. Um, uh, it's, it's not a particularly difficult problem, although I agree with you that it needs to be addressed and the counties need to be given a procedure promptly. Mm -hmm. But but the New York City procedure is already written, and frankly, that procedure could easily. Um, but the city board, as I understand it, controls its own records. So if I move from Brooklyn to Richmond County, um, 
the city board has all my records. So they can, they can look at the signature. Right. They can look at the record that they control right now. Right now, Erie does not control Monroe's. Monroe's does not control Erie. Does Monroe have access to Erie that would allow them to do the necessary research to determine if you voted well, in Erie? If, if the voter registered with a new registration, as opposed to voting by affidavit ballot, you have a, a procedure in place for processing the transfer of that registration. Mm -hmm. And that procedure would remain unchanged, essentially. You but you're not registering you now. I'm coming in on election no, day and No, if someone voting. just walks into the booth right. and says, I want to vote, right. I, I am registered in such and such a county. This is a different county. Right. You have to give them an affidavit ballot. Correct. Now they have an affidavit ballot. Correct. Now somehow we have to check out whether they voted again and transfer the record. Correct. You know, the, the voted, just to get this the yeah, voted again Fair enough. Um, is um, it's not part of the New York City procedure. In other words, they don't check to see whether they voted at the old address. Um, uh, Obviously, if they did, it would come up eventually when they did voter history because they would show up. No, but you would have to check that it was a legitimate voter and get the record transfer. It's, you would treat the affidavit ballot As the same way you would treat a registration application. Uh, uh, it simply moves the, re it transfers the registration um, uh, from the old registration address to the new registration address, and where that crosses county lines, we already have a procedure in place, um, how the database operates when somebody files a new registration, when a, a, a previously registered voter files a new registration in a different county, um, under the Help America Vote Act, that that is not technically a new registration. The registration has to be transferred across county lines. And um, I'm just looking at the physical aspect of this, okay? Yeah, so I'm saying this is basically already worked out. Um, but, 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 but Commissioner Kaczynski is correct that uh, we need to promptly Put right. it in writing with a procedure that we can send out to the county boards, but I I don't anticipate any significant change in 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 the process now of uh, how voters who move within the state have their registrations so, so processed. What do we do now? We we uh, look at New York City. So we have the staff do something, write something up, give it to the four of us. Well, we take we, a we look normally would do that first. We would probably want to meet and talk first before we start writing, and, and that would probably be more helpful. You know, what do we think? But doesn't necessarily always. Um, it, it certainly helps know where people are coming from before we start writing. But then we would start writing anyway after that just to try and incorporate any thoughts that were um, shared it in in the beginning um, and certainly we would look at all of the bills probably you know where are we on this specific proposal where are we on some of the other ones so we can then maybe delegate them to different when, staff members when, to come up with a first draft so that we have some starting point when would we have to approve this well the sooner the better um, we would have to do an emergency anyway um, you know, under a 60-day effective date mm -hmm. because we, we, there's just not 60 days to enact regulation. Um, so certainly the sooner the better uh, to have a draft so people can start proposing alternative language or, you know, have some, some starting point to comment. So you're saying that the city board process right now allows me to transfer, which I think the state law does within the city, as long as if, if I move from Brooklyn to Richmond, let's say, and if I vote at Richmond, um, Richmond doesn't check to make sure I didn't vote in Brooklyn too? Not, not when they process the affidavit ballot. Okay. But so they will count the affidavit before they, dis before they check to see if I voted in Brooklyn at, on the machine? That's correct. I see. But if you did vote twice, it right. would come up in the voter history mm -hmm. because you would have uh, the new borough listing that you voted by affidavit ballot mm -hmm. um, with the transfer, mm -hmm. and the old borough would show that you mm -hmm. voted in person. Mm -hmm. But you still have to and check the affidavit ballot against the fact that this person was pre-registered somewhere else. 
Now, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the voter history would show that the person voted twice. And as far as I know, in the, um, what is it now, 23 years that this has been in place, that uh, there has never been a case of someone who has um, transferred on election day um, having voted twice. That's not my, my, my question deals with the fact that what can an affidavit be, what can I say I want to vote here? They say you're not registered. I say I was registered in New York City and now I live here in Suffolk County and I want to register and they give me an affidavit ballot to vote on. That's okay. good. Now they have to check to see if I was registered there. Otherwise, Correct. I'm unregistered. But that's in the statewide database. They have they the have, ability. So they can check to the statewide well, database. They would have okay. to check the they statewide They have the ability database. to look. They, I mean, they, a person in, say, oh, the Monroe example in the Erie, Monroe can't change the Erie, but they can look they and can see check, the record. See, see the, okay. um, the report that, you know, everybody kind of calls it something else, but the report's kind of like a, we call it an extract file. Counties call it a voter dump which has kind of like a one-page sample of what the record looks like. It doesn't include the voter history on that page, but at least it gives you the name, address, date of registrations, um, you know, to the extent you have a client ID, the last four digits of Social Security, your signature w would be available to any county to see. We also have voter history to the extent a county gave it to us, and they do give it to us under our existing regulations at all different times. So we could look to try and encourage, I mean, a reg that has, if they're not collecting voter history until March after the election, um, it's, it would be a concern to rely on it. But certainly, what, what, um, you know, we could look at all those issues. But at least for the data that is currently there, the NICE voter system does show to any county board, uh, they have the ability to give user rights to their employees to look at this information. Okay. The only issue that I, is clearly an issue is they should see the signature so they could do a comparison without the watermark. We, we watermark it. It shouldn't be too much to take the watermark away, but then I'm not a technology person. We'd have to meet with our IT people to make sure that they could do that for boards of election login people, it, just as some of the types okay. of things. There's other things we'd have to look at also. You just add a line to the affidavit saying I haven't voted any other place this year, period. Well, if they lie, that's a crime, sure, okay. and it's just no, a no matter what. It's a reinforcement, that's <laughs> yep. all. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. good. Right. And that's why I don't know, is that a, you know, certainly we'll look, look to do our best to accommodate as many views, but I, I, I don't, I mean, I remember how we did the voter registration, or excuse me, the enrollment transfers in the early 90s before, uh, NVRA went into effect, and we did a lot of this without any computers in the, at that period of time, where the anybody who registered who said I previously lived in another county, we had to handwrite a postcard, and at the end of the week, we would mail them to all of our other counties. Monday morning, you'd get that stack of mail, and they would look you up and write on that card and come back to us. And based on that what the previous county told us, we would go to your original document, because that's what was there on the poll site on election day, and we would say you were a Democrat in Albany County and you're now a change of enrollment in my county. Now, we changed the law in the 90s to stop that when NVRA happened, but we did all that work back then to make sure that your party followed you, and in NVRA that stopped. But we used to do it all. So if we could do it then without technology, we ought to be able to accomplish something similar with the technology. Mm -hmm. The fact is there aren't many people my vintage left who remember doing it. So we should anticipate approving some regs in the next two months? Yes. Is that, is that correct? I think so. Okay. Can we just talk a minute then about what the other bill that I was interested That's the early voting bill, which we also have an obligation to promulgate rules and regs on. So, so that's a longer period, right? What's our, what's our time frame on that one? Well, that's in effect within the 2019 election. So what would be our anticipated need to do rules and regs on that? 
think the main issue is to give guidance to the counties on what they need to do to select they their have a, They have a May sites. 1st deadline, right? To I'm not sure that there are any regs that are needed, um, as opposed to providing guidance. assistance to the counties. I don't think the statute mandates regulations. It just gives us the authority if we want to exercise it. But I'm not aware of any regs that we'd actually need to implement it. I, I, depending on how you want to enforce, you know, because the issue is with, you know, part of the plan that the counties have to do by May 1st is, is not so much identify the poll sites, but as identify the plan for how they will accommodate having sufficient voting so that they don't, so that they're able to accommodate the voting and wait time for those voters. And given the size of the populations that have been, pro you know, that are in the statute for the one for 50,000. Um, How would you regulate that? As opposed to, I, I understand that we have to implement it, and it's a very complex implementation project, and, and so far uh, the funds have not been uh, allocated to do that, so that um, uh, that that issue will certainly be an important one for discussion uh, in the adoption of the budget. But in terms of regulations, <coughs> while the statute gives us authority to issue regulations, I'm not sure I see anything that actually needs a regulation as opposed to us providing assistance and, uh, and guidance on how to implement. Well, what about the number of voting systems per voter? I mean, those are in the regulations, and they're set designed for an election day registration. Well, we could do that so by reg if you want. Extrapolating wanted to. that out, you know, based on the current numbers we have, you know, it would, given the size of the voters for the poll site, and you know, granted it's spread out over a number of days, you know, nine days for, in theory, for fifty thousand, um, you would have to have a fairly large number of machines, which is, I don't believe what was anticipated, I mean, I don't know, I'd be reading the mind of whoever wrote it, um, that I don't know that was expected, but we set those numbers for the number of workstations, the number of scanners, uh, to force the counties to try, that's what we came up with that the machine can process in order to keep the wait times down. So I think if we don't for election that, day poll sites, right? We don't have that for early voting poll sites. But if we, if I just applied those, then I would have a very large number, of, right, potentially large number of machines. I don't think anybody intends for us to apply. Listen, I have an open mind. If people want to have a regulation, we can we can look at it. I mean, um, I, we're open too. It's just that I, you know, that obviously we're not a party to the drafting of this. So I would hope that there was a. You know, I don't know who to speak to to get what was in your mind when, hey, you wrote this, what did you think was going to happen? Well, this is a proposal that's been out for years. It's passed the assembly. It was in the governor's proposal, and the Election Commissioners Association annually has attempted to talk about it, but has not succeeded in getting a consensus even to talk about it. So certainly, um, there has been a conversation. We've appeared before two public hearings together, but with a different message. Um, over four years talking about it. So so now now we really have to talk about it because we have to implement it. So certainly we will look at whether or not counties uh, must follow the regulation because an election day poll site is, is different than an early voting poll site or that we would come up with new numbers anyway. Um, um, and, and certainly we can either give guidance or propose if Todd thinks it's more preference or more importantly if the four commissioners think it's more preference but that we put it in reg as opposed to guidance. Either way we need to communicate, we need to talk, come up with a plan, communicate with you and make sure that we all agree on what we should communicate to the counties. Mm -hmm. Earlier the better I agree. I mean, there's, I mean there's some direction in the statute for us to do certain things. You know, for example, it says the Board of Elections shall establish procedures subject to the approval of the State Board of Elections to ensure that persons who vote during early voting shall not be permitted to vote subsequently. In other words, double voting. So it imposes on us an obligation to approve whatever plan 
the county comes up with to implement this program to ensure double voting doesn't occur. So that's an obligation on mm -hmm. us. We have to do it. We have to have a procedure. I think we have to have some sort of standards we're looking for. And while this allows the county board to do it, I would think we'd be interested in a statewide type of process. So what's going on in one county is not significantly different from another county. So every voter in the state is being treated equally. So it seems to me there is some obligations this county or this state board has vis-a-vis -vis the implementation of this. It also goes on state board of elections uh, shall uh, shall issue ru rules and regulations that shall include but not be limited to, and then it lists out, ensure ballots that are cast early by any method are counted in Canvas, ensure the efficient and fair early voting process. So there are obligations put on this board to implement the statute. So I don't think it's quite as easy to say, well, we, we can just sit back and let the counties do it, and we don't really have any role here. We do. And I'm just trying to understand how we're going to fulfill that role, what our thoughts are as far as getting this rolled out in a timely manner. And Bob, you're right. I mean, this has been out there for years, but not in a but it, but but the implementation of it is what's at issue here today. This we're not we're, we're no longer discussing the wisdom of doing this. We're discussing how to do this. So I think we need to focus on that because the statute, frankly, doesn't give us a lot of direction. I mean, it gives us an outline. It tells us we want early voting in New York. And we want it done you know, over a you know 10-day period, and we want this, but it doesn't give us the nitty-gritty about how to do it. It doesn't give us the nitty-gritty about how the counties have to implement this. It gives us some broad guidelines. For example, uh, one I looked at is it, it, it says you must have one at least one early voting site for every 50,000 eligible voters. Poll increments. Poll, poll increments of 50,000. Okay. Poll, so you know if I'm an upstate county, you know I'm looking at this saying saying I mean I'll take. From, where I'm from, uh, uh, Cattaraugus County, big county, less than 50,000 voters, but it's a county of rather significant geographic size. So if I'm in that county and I have one poll site for 50,000 voters, you're going to force people to drive 30, 40 miles to go to that one site. Is that reasonable? I don't think so. So to implement this, to say, well, we've set these parameters out in law, now go ahead and implement it, to me, it's, it's not that simple. I mean, upstate, you've got huge geographic counties with relatively small voting populations, but to accommodate them on an early voting site, I don't think it's fair necessarily to say, you get one site in a county where I'm driving 30, 40 miles to get to that site, maybe, because of the distances. And we should be accommodating voters better than that, in my view. And so while the statute has this population uh, rule, it doesn't accommodate distant rules. Well, it's a minimum maximum. I know. There's nothing I understand it. counties from having more. I understand that, but I'm telling you from my standpoint, as a statewide matter, it seems to me we have some interest in making sure that the voters throughout the state are serviced and serviced appropriately. You know, my, my assumption, because I didn't read this, my assumption was that we would do exactly that. What's that? that they would get together, we would be involved in the discussion on how to do things like that, looking at the problems, and then a final draft would come back to us and we'd approve it or disprove it. Right. So, I, I mean, I, I agree something like that has to be done, and I think that, that that's what's going to happen. That's, that's, that was my, just my assumption, because mm -hmm. it's typically the way we handle any of these things. Right. And I think some language generally, uh, the. Uh, whether or not we agree we need a regulation, even though it says shall, it shall only is if we need it to accomplish, um, you know, early voting, say, in that parameter. But if they've been, the counties have a long history of making sure that people don't vote twice. So depending on what is different about early voting, not voting twice, um, is just something we have to look at. Does it really require regulation, or is it well, something that's long-established policy? If the statute says shall establish a regulation, then we have to do it. Uh, so that's it's, the language. Well, I just I just think the realistic. You read is not discretion. And I think, I think realistically speaking, so we'll you know, this statute gives us a sort of outline, mm -hmm. but to flesh it out, I don't think it's realistic to do it without some more meat on the bones, so to speak, some more detail to the counties of here's how to implement this because this broad parameter is too broad in my view to ensure that there is a a, a, a uniform application 
of this statute across the state and that our voters are being, you know, right now we have rules, for example, on size of poll sites, size of EDs. You can only have so many voters assigned to an ED. That's statewide. We do that to make sure there's a uniform standard across the state that voters have equal access to the poll place. This, this now creates a whole different set of rules. This one per 50,000, as I outlined, in upstate counties is going to be significantly different from those in more heavily populated areas where 50,000 voters might be in a relatively small geographic area. You're now upstate going to have voters, 50,000 voters, in very large geographic areas. Well, is it fair to say to them, you might have to drive 50 miles to get to your poll site if you want to vote early, as opposed to maybe downstate where you're having to vote, having to drive five miles to get to your poll site because of the density of the population. Is that fair? I think we need to answer those questions, and we need to address those questions, because I think to be fair, there should be a uniformity to the implementation of any voting standard in this state, rather than just, you know, allowing rural voters to be forced to drive what we might consider unreasonably long distances. So it's not about the, you know, you say, well, yeah, we've been talking about this. Yeah, we have been talking about this for years, but not to this detail, not to this level of how is it actually going to be implemented. And I'd like to know what the thoughts are, because I don't see it here in the statute, about how that implementation is going to occur. So it's not just double voting. I mean, that's one issue. Uh, but I think there are other issues that also need to be fleshed out, and we should be involved in it. Absolutely. So we will work to have those conversations and to start working on drafts so that we can present them at a future meeting. So those conversations haven't started, is that what you're saying? You no, guys? they have started. Oh, it has. Okay, yes. good. So do you have any, th I mean, are there any thoughts here or are we just... Um, I, I think that the, that the, you know, the, the conversations that have occurred so far are obviously um, um, relatively new. We do have an important bill in a short period of time to get it done, but we also don't even have them signed yet. Um, but I certainly have been talking about all of the issues um, that you've raised at, at various points in time. Um, in the last week or so, you know, county commissioners have called and raised some of the issues that you've um, that you've outlined. Um, and, and there's a there on, on that particular issue, there's a threshold question of how much reliance will there be on the discretion of the counties to address the issue and an appreciation for the fact that they may, because they're closest situated to their um, population demographics, um, you know, will they um, will they deal with it? I mean, in fact, the statute says that travel time um, to the um, uh, early voting site and equitable access um, are factors that are to be taken into consideration by the local board. So, of course, if the State Board of Elections wants to amplify precisely what those considerations need to be for the local board, we, we certainly could do that. Um, but I think both at the, the local level, the people that have read it, um, you know, uh, and have echoed some of your concerns about um, how to deal with sparsely populated geography. Um, you know, as a rural voter myself, um, I find myself having to drive a lot further to do things than some people um, um, who live in more urban settings do. To some extent, that's a factor of rural living. But on the other hand, if a site is 50 miles away, to your point, Commissioner, in certain places in the state, you know, at some point, that may be deemed um, an unacceptable burden. And the state board and the county boards in consultation with each other, I'm sure, will be able to come up with a way to resolve those issues. And, and I mean, what's our plan here then? Is there a time frame within which we intend to get some sort of advice, rules, whatever we're going to call these, out to have the counties implement this? Is there some, I know this has to be done for the <coughs> general election. Correct. This is, that'll, that's yes. the first time this will be used, so it'll be the November election. We have in our minds when we need to get our regs, procedures, again, whatever you want to call them, done in order to have time to actually implement this new program. Why can't we do this by April meeting? 
I don't know. I'm asking the staff, I guess, if they've yeah, thought about this. Time. April's fine with me. Whatever. We, we have thought about the, the need to do it. Um, there have been conversations about what needs to be done, and I think that the, that the, the onus is to get something in writing as soon as possible. Um, I cannot imagine that we would take until April to have something written. I think that we will. We, this is obviously a, a key and top priority. I will, I will, but I'll be honest with you, a specific calendar um, date by which we would get it done, I have not discussed with my colleagues. And, but, and but there are two, there are two additional understand. factors that will be important on how this is uh, formulated. One is uh, uh, whether there will be adequate funding from the state budget. Mm -hmm. um, and the second is um, whether uh, electronic poll books will be authorized which many of us have said are essential for implementing uh, this system, especially in, uh, in the larger counties. Um, uh, and if electronic poll books are authorized, then we have to um, be able to gear up very quickly with a certification program uh, so that uh, we, we can test and uh, approve uh, what systems the counties acquire. I agree with you that electronic poll books would be a key component to implementation of this. I'm wondering if you have any insight into whether or not that will be approved for this year or even in the future. Is that Because that wasn't part of the bill, which actually was a little unfortunately surprising to me is I was Interested because that's a that's but, always been a piece of this discussion and it wasn't in the bill So is there any my understanding is that it wasn't in the bill because of the budget issues? Okay. And so that uh, that the legislative leadership has uh, had, had postponed consideration of it to include it within the budget So we make it a um, whole new component to this when the budget that's passed. that's my point um, I think from our perspective, we're going to start, we need I to, mean, we're we thinking need to in just preliminary, we would start writing based on what we have. Mm -hmm. And to the extent um, something else firms up as a, a when and a, and a what, um, then we can adjust. Well, let me ask you but this I don't want to wait till. A, I agree with you, Bob. I don't need right. I agree with you. Let me ask you this question. Uh, let's say they do approve. Or, or um, electronic poll books. Are we prepared to certify this year? Is that something we can do? We'd have to do it. Are we prepared to do it? Is there a... Right now, I, well, I'll turn to Brendan and ask... Uh, We've had no conversations on any kind of standards or any, anything to criteria to meet to certify any kind of electronic book. I have not been part of any conversation, I should say that. So when we did digital, you know, when we stopped with the, um, the, the actual buff card at the poll site and went to the photocopy image that we use now. It was more of a functional testing at that point in time um, because it was the document, you know, it was, did, did the system print the words on a page and the page is what was in the poll site. So certainly we would have to look at um, what we would need to do to, well, first of all, what is the bill authorized to allow to happen in a poll site or an early voting site? Um, and then what would we need to do to verify that the systems presented for sale in New York um, meet that? So it's it's still unclear to me what would be included in a bill. Um, from that perspective, uh, but we're not inventing the wheel because many 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 states uh, now use electronic poll books. There are many systems on the market. And um, some states do have robust certification procedures. And um, we should promptly assemble them and be ready if we see the bill moving. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if there's a plan to do that, but I agree. I think rather than sitting back and waiting, I, 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 I we think should be out front because right. if this gets put on us in April when the budget gets passed, and we have to have electronic poll books ready for October. Uh, that's a pretty short time period. Right. And we might have to do something interim. But um, And then you'd have the whole training issue for so the counties to train their poll workers on the use of these electronic poll books. That's the component. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's a major component, by the way. 
may be bigger than the certification component, but it's big either way. So certification, I don't know. I mean, it took us years to do certification of voting machines. So I'm just trying to understand how we're going to push through the certification of an, of an electronic poll book when it's t how many years have we been going through the process of trying to certify voting machines in this state. It's taken us, it takes us a long time to certify these machines, and I don't know why it would take us less time to certify an electronic poll book. Well, I could answer that question. I mean, they're okay. very different. Um, uh, we were at the cutting edge in setting forth our regulations uh, with voting machines. We were the first state to uh, prohibit internet connections and, um, and one of the early states to uh, require a voter verifiable paper audit trail. You'll recall that uh, the majority of the systems that were submitted failed to meet uh, our certification standards and that there were only two systems that were ultimately approved and only after we discovered substantial flaws in the federal certification system um, which created um, two years of delay in our certification process. Um, but uh, just the opposite is the case with electronic poll books where there is very substantial history now. But I would urge that the operations unit uh, um, start devoting time to uh, reviewing the uh, certification procedures used in other states and um, to use that as a model. And indeed, we might be able to shortcut some of the uh, testing process by relying on certifications from states with a robust certification process. Well, I would hope we'd have a plan for that as well because, again, if they do adopt this in the budget process, that means we'll know about it April 1 and have a very quick turnaround then for mm -hmm. implementation of electronic poll books. Correct. So I think... Not ideal. Okay. Well, I, uh, I'm sure the staff has a lot of work ahead of it to try to get this stuff put into place. So I guess we'll be expecting to see stuff sooner rather than later because I would like to see it so I have time to look it over and approve it before. I know the boards have to get us their plans by May 1. I was, I was looking at that as sort of the time frame the early voting process was working within because they were given a, d a mandated time of May 1 to get us a plan which by the way um, I don't know if we actually approve but they have to get it to us I don't know that I saw language in here that we actually approve the plan or, or if they just have to file it with us so I'm not sure how that works well we have supervisory authority anyway whether it's in the statute or not. If we don't like the plan, we have the authority to tell them that we don't like it. So this may take longer than May 1, but I would think that if they have an obligation of May 1, we should be working with a similar time frame to get them guidance as to what we think they need to do in order to implement this early voting process. We all agree on that. Okay. So, Peter. <laughs> well, no. I, I, oh, you have other issues? No, I don't. I was, didn't know if they, I <laughs> sort of interrupted here. I didn't know if they were done. Are you guys done with your report? I'm done. I'm done. done. You're both done. Okay. And we'll move on to council compliance. And Kim is in here. So, Brian. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, it has been a, uh, a very busy uh, month. Council's unit participated in the Election Commissioners Association um, conference um, and made uh, two uh, presentations. Obviously, the January periodic um, was due, and um, the review of those filings are underway uh, by the staff. Our uh, training staff has reached out to all of the county boards of elections to introduce themselves, and we're in the process of in the process of training, um, or scheduling rather, the campaign finance training uh, sessions for this year. It happens about this time. 
Um, in, the, um, in the area of uh, our cases, um, uh, we have entered into a uh, the, sort of the end of the litigation phase altogether in um, Eason related to the usability of our website and are uh, firmly in the, in the settlement uh, component or, or the compliance, uh, settlement compliance component of that case. In common cause, um, uh, we, uh, we have an answer due on, uh, on Friday and we're in the discovery stage. Um, League of Women Voters, um, our answer um, is, uh, is due on the 28th and we're being represented by the um, Attorney, General, Attorney General's Office on that and they're working with us. Uh, of course, we had a, um, a lawsuit filed against the board um, last week, um, Sugarman versus the New York State Board of Elections. Um, there was an application in there for a um, temporary for temporary relief um, to stay the application of Regulation 6203, and the judge denied that. Um, and that uh, that is returnable on uh, March 1, uh, with our papers due in that case by the 22nd, and any any reply to 21st. our papers due by the by the 28th. 21st. 21st, excuse me. I, I apparently have a, a really hard time with it not being the 22nd. Okay. It has been the 21st in the beginning, and I keep saying 22nd. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, the uh, the legislature acted on um, seven bills related to, um, to, um, <clears throat> to election reform, and the commissioner brought up a, a number of those. And obviously, there are various requirements of um, the agency and, of and also the council's unit with respect to those, and we're continuing to look at that and, and, um, and be on top of that. Um, with respect to uh, campaign finance um, filings, um, of the 2,500 um, July periodic filings uh, that were made as of the 18th, um, 2,311 remain out of compliance. Um, the, um, the January 2018, not the 2019 uh, periodic filing, of the original 2,530 uh, non-filers, uh, 1,928 remain. Um, with respect to referred deficiencies, um, roughly 1,600, 1,629 uh, that were not reclassified um, uh, uh, as a result of changes in criteria, um, 1,245 uh, remain not in compliance, 384 um, have come into um, compliance. And in the aggregate, in terms of the workload of the unit, uh, we have received um, 119,460 filings and have completed uh, work on reviewing uh, 106,710. In a nutshell. Bill, did you have anything to add? No, sir. Make sure you have any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Questions? No? Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to election operations. I see Tom Connolly is in here, so Brendan. Yep, yeah, we, uh, Tom and I participated in the uh, <coughs> election commissioner conference in January. We're also continuing to collect the uh, statistical survey uh, from the counties. Um, we've collected and amended the results as, as we did earlier today. Uh, on the Voting machine front, we did receive some hardware, and ESNS was on site to provide uh, an overview of their uh, express vote. Uh, we met with NISTEC about another upgrade to a clear ballot um, and the ESNS submission. Um, Orange County is currently in the law library doing a EMS refresher training with staff. Um, our cybersecurity. Uh, the team has been very busy as well. They have gone uh, with Grant Thornton to assessments at Rensselaer, Saratoga, and Schenectady counties. Um, met with them on calls, reached out to the counties. They've also, they're continuing to work on uh, removal, removable media erasers for the, for the counties and um, best practices for that as well. Um, They've reviewed the risk assessment reports uh, in association with that, and um, we've also continued to work on our, our shoebox and the campus upgrade with, with IT and, um, and everything else. So that's all I got. Okay. Any questions for Brian? No? Okay. Thank you. Then we'll move on to NVRA, PIO, John Conklin, and Cheryl Couch. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Public Information Office was relatively quiet over the holiday season until last week. Um, uh, hot topics included the general election results, campaign finance disclosure reports, uh, changes at the state legislature due to the election. Uh, we were part of the winter meeting of the Election Commissioners Association here in Albany, as mentioned by other units. Um, Cybersecurity preparations and obviously the new legislation changing election administration in New York State. So the unit has participated uh, uh, in the monthly call with the ECA back in December. Uh, we've been part of the meetings on the cybersecurity plans and the implementation of the contact contracts for risk assessment, intrusion detection, and managed security services for the county boards. Uh, we processed 86 FOIL requests in December. Um, as Brian mentioned, we're continuing to participate in meetings on the Eason lawsuit, although it's coming down to the, uh, the end. Um, for the website, we posted the election results for the general election. Uh, we've uh, made some changes to the campaign finance web pages, primarily with the seminar schedule and campaign finance filing calendar, um, letting people know that there'll be changes in their upcoming. Uh, we removed a lot of uh, extra stuff from the home page uh, to, to sort of declutter after the election, lists of candidates and various things like that. Um, the 2019 proposed legislative packet has been posted. Uh, the webcast and the agendas for the December 14th meeting have been posted. Uh, for NVRA, uh, the unit visited the Suffolk uh, County Board of Elections. They were uh, found to be compliant. Uh, that was last week. Um, and that's that's all I have right now. Shelly, you want to add anything? No, thank you. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Oh, okay. Then we'll move on. Now I see that we have ITU listed, but Bill Cross is not here. Does someone else want to report for him? Bill um, has a number of items. I don't know if you want. You have a written report? We have a written report. Oh, good. Is it in my packet, by the way? Well, he just gave it to us this morning. Yeah, I didn't have Okay. I, I so can, we don't have All right. Go ahead, then. <clears throat> Uh, to over the number of items, uh, certainly we continue to work on 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 his uh, list of projects um, to come up with a better date as to when Capus Fidus will be able to roll out. Certainly, um, plugging the hole in the budget is a very critical part to coming up with a date that he can stand behind. So I think we have a a little bit more time to get you a better date. Um, but it certainly is something that he continues to work on. Um, he, we're, did, he, he did tell us this year, I know, at one well, point. Well, um, if we're three million in the hole, that if, if, and both capital and and uh, personnel, let's say it gets filled. Let's say the budget gets filled. Let's assume that we for are, a minute. We, we are well. We are working desperately to get it out rolled out this year. Okay. Um, whether it has a future phase because of. Uh, some other issues. Um, one, we're kind of looking at like the paid digital ad. Um, you know, we have a temporary workaround, and in order to streamline getting the system out, do we just leave the workaround in place for one more year and roll it out in a future phase as a all one system? So we're we're still meeting to try and figure out: is, are they so far into it anyway? Which which would be easier to roll out? But certainly. Um, uh, we we have not moved to a year other than 19 in our own should, strong should encouragement. Should I assume that the LLC change has made some difference to the implementation, or not really? <clears throat> uh, if I can speak to that, um, yeah. I I the the LLC change primarily is going to impact um, the the you know, the the rules related to what the LLCs themselves can actually do, but there are some changes. Um, that uh, our system is going to have to accommodate. Um, and in terms of the, the, what I'll call the legacy system, the one that we're on right now, we do have staff looking at how we're going to sort of um, round hole, square peg, fix that problem in the interim with the, how to tell people to comply with, for example, the additional attribution requirement. Um, because, we don't, because it doesn't currently apply to the LLC code. So we are working on that. But it, the, the extent to which that that will affect the Capus Fidus um, a larger project, um, it has, while it has not been determined, it does not seem to be a, a significant um, 
change because the exact things that are going to be required to be done by LLCs are done by other entities um, in our um, in our system. Okay. So you don't see that as a big impediment to rolling out I, the campus fighter system. I, I do not, and I wish Bill Prosser you don't want to have speak an opportunity to disagree with me if you'd like to, but I don't. But I don't believe that it is. Okay. Well, I mean, it's an example though. If we if they if they come to the conclusion that something needs to happen, do we want? Is there a, a temporary workaround that will be acceptable, or is it something that we have to ask IT to write into the rolling out this new program? At some point, we have to stop doing that and put out something, and yeah, then all of the agree. temporary workarounds <laughs> would be in a future phase. Yeah, I guess from my standpoint, we keep getting changes which impact this, which delay this. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting for this for a long time. Five years. Um, and I yeah. hate to you know, just take the position that, well, just because they made a little change to the election law, we're going to have to you know, push that back another year. We're never going to roll <coughs> this thing out. I think it's an important rollout. I think having mm -hmm. FITUS more accessible to the public is something we should be doing. And I really am against, I guess, Delaying it because of a if, if if we can do a workaround for you know temporarily to address a couple of these issues and get the main component out, I think that's important to well, do. Um, one of the items that Todd, myself, and Bill Cross talked about, especially in light of the budget, even if we have full funding in the budget, does it make sense to since we already have a workaround for the paid digital ad, which was last year's bill? Um, does it make sense to hold up rolling this out any further by implementing that? We want our goal was to be able to implement that into the system, but does it make sense to do it or not? And Bill um, said he would go back and talk to his staff and meet with us in order to tell us is it more work to, to finish it or to roll it? And we don't have that answer yet, but it's certainly the conversation we've been having with them. We need to roll this out. We have to stop making it perfect before we can do anything. We want it to work, but does it have to have every one of these changes? And then once we get one done, another one gets passed. You know, the la three of the last four years, they've amended the budget to require uh, independent expenditure, something that has had a short period of time that we've stopped doing things in order to incorporate. So at some point, we have to, you know, it has to be in a future phase. We have to acknowledge that. Uh, we haven't had that. We have, we've had like the first rung of the 12-step program to get there, but we have a long way to go to say that stop. You know, anything else has to be in a future phase. And then the problem is, is we don't have enough money to finish this phase, much less a future phase. So how honest are we to say it will be in a future phase? I think it would be in a future phase to the extent funding is made available to make it a future phase. And until then, whatever workaround that they find acceptable is going to be the workaround until we come up with money or free up our IT staff from other responsibilities to do this workaround. So, uh, you know, those are the kind of things we have to, the eye at any of these new proposals. Um, how important is it? Is there no other way to do it uh, in order to come up with rolling this out. Well, and, that, and that's also on top of anything that they take out of the Article 7 bill. You know, there are components of that that would certainly impact Capus Fidus, and, you know, that's a whole other ball of wax. What are you so. referring to? Well, the, the governor's budget bill has any number of things related to, to public financing and, re, and certain disclosures that would be required to be filed, additional data elements that would be required to be filed as part of the report. So additional reports potentially so depending on what bits or pieces come out of that or if not the whole thing then that would have an impact on the system so you know unfortunately last year when paid internet digital ads passed the council met and they found to the extent there could be a workaround and still we had to divert IT resources to make it happen sure. because it had a date certain mm -hmm. um, so to the extent there are new LLC loophole, whatever they are, if they can figure out a workaround that's acceptable, we communicate that to the filers. If, if it doesn't require uh, diverting staff to make it happen, certainly they have to have those conversations. Hopefully if there's another way of doing it and we just describe to people, here's how you accommodate it for now. Um, but we haven't finished those. You know, certainly those are in our head. 
it would be advisable to do as much work around as possible so that we can roll this program out without further delay. To a date, I still don't have for you. I understand. I know the date does keep moving, but again, I hate to keep pushing it off I because there's been another <coughs> change in the law that requires another amendment to FITUS because FITUS is a big program and there's a lot of information in there and I don't like to hold it up because the LLC stuff isn't quite ready, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a workaround, it seems to me that would be the way to go to get the bulk of the information out there in a better format for people to look at. So I do think that should still be our goal and if, if we have to delay incorporating a couple elements into it for a little while, I think that's the way to go. And get the bulk of it out there because right now FITUS is hard to work with. I mean the fact of the matter is if I'm a member of the public and I go into our FITUS system and try to find information, it is difficult and it should not be. And I think we have an obligation to get this thing fixed sooner rather than later. And I've been very frustrated, I don't think I'm the only one, with the delay after delay after delay in getting this thing out there because, frankly, for me, from a public perspective, it, it, it's one of the most important things we do as a state board. And I don't think we do a very good job of it. And we haven't done a very good job of it for the entire time we've had this program, which is 1999. It's 20 years now. And it's not a very good program. It is very difficult to search and find what you're looking for and know how to do it. And that's not right. I mean, people are used to having a simple search engine that they look at right now, and we're not it. Well, they have more money to make a search engine. Well, that engine may be. That do. may be. But you know, it's not just the money. And we know that some of it has been just, oh, this new program came out. We got to implement that. And we got to incorporate that. That's going to delay. Really? You know, how many times can we let that drive the bus, which is what it's doing? We have the exception driving the rule. The rule should be this system is out there and able to search easily by the public, not just by professionals who happen to know how it works, but by anybody that wants to look at it. And right now with Google and these other search engines, people are used to being, and they can't do it here. And that's just, that's just wrong. So I would encourage you to try to get it out there yes, and yeah. not let this newest change hold it up if it doesn't have to. Okay. Um, other security issues, I think the importance of, you know, um, cybersecurity, we have completed now 44 uh, site visits with Grant Thornton, our contractor with County Boards of Elections. We continue to work to schedule the remaining counties. Um, uh, for that for that perspective and how best to uh, um, get the reports uh, and, and information in a usable format that both county boards can use it as a road map of what they need to do to fix their systems and we could use it as a road map for the next steps that we need to implement either by way of mitigation services requests for funding to mitigate or are there regulatory items that we or oversight that we need to incorporate so, so it's um, it's well on its way to completion, um, um, but it's still a significant energy uh, and effort that you know almost all of our staffs are involved at some point to make sure it's as it's a, as successful a project as possible. The other investment of money, which one of the largest investments in our cybersecurity portfolio, is the intrusion detection services. Um, it, we've gone back and forth with our vendor as to now that we have the information from counties as to what they specifically um, uh, their their network configurations and where the election infrastructure is is placed um, we were hoping in our conversations with counties we'd find that some of the election infrastructure is segmented separately from the whole rest of the county uh, unfortunately, the answer is no, it's just kind of blended in there. So uh, an issue that might happen to the Parks Department could make its way to the infrastructure of the elections um, for the voter registration component, not the voting machine part. Um, so certainly that makes the intrusion detection services more important, but also it has to go and be sized um, beyond just elections. Uh, we're rolling out this week there were phone calls with the, the original seven counties that were in that pilot 
to be ready next week to impl to install those intrusion detection services, assuming all of that works the way um, is th that the planners planned it to work, and that we don't have any adverse issues that need us to adjust the plan. We would then um, find the pilot was successful, and quickly um, uh, be able to roll out the rest of the counties that have that are that are part of that. And that's a mandatory requirement to have that system in place or to already have the equivalent of it. And that that system would be highlighted if we do implement electronic poll books? Well, it's an intrusion detection to, to the county system. security to the voter registration data. It, uh, IDS the, does not provide security. It just lets you know who is trying to get through the open networks to your system. So it, it follows. Um, are there are there issues with who is? Well, I just mentioned that access. because, as we know, the voting machines are standalones, and the kind of intrusion concerns that people have with systems don't really apply to voting machines because they're standalones. But the voting registration system, which would be incorporated into the electronic poll book, is not, and it's on a it's on a statewide system. So, security issues become more important vis-a-vis having electronic poll books out there that contain electronic data from a system that is not right. but fully I, internal. I, I don't, I, I agree with that, but an intrusion detection is only gotcha. who's knocking on I your gotcha. door. It doesn't, it, it's not a firewall. It doesn't, it doesn't, right, people shouldn't ex assume that since it's there, we are safe. All it is is a system that is giving you information who's, who's, attempting to get into your system and where those are abnormal okay. uh, and or or somebody inside trying to do something that shouldn't happen but so having that in place is helpful to see what's going on but we don't then provide some sort of mechanism for the county to utilize to ensure that their system is not being encroached upon by an outside entity well it's it's um, the next you mean a firewall system? In I guess place. that's the term. For yeah, um, those would come out of the risk assessment to what do they have, and to the extent it's good or bad. Okay. We are scanning from the. But let's say we let's say we discover a county has a bad what we would describe as a bad security system. We've now identified. Do we then provide funding or assistance for the county to improve it? So we're comfortable now that that county has upgraded their security program to ensure our. Our data is being is, is being securely held, or or, or no? Um, well, that's what we're hopeful to do with the, we call it the mitigation funds based upon the risk assessment. Um, that we would have funds to address. You know, we'd have to we'd have to do it. of what are the most critical needs? You know, that we can that then a what can we afford based upon those critical needs? So we are exact. That's exactly what we're looking to do. But it's just a question of whether or not we would have uh, the capability to provide that. Every county had such a large problem. They, you know, the, the problem is, as Bob alluded to before, that, you know, since the elections are not segregated on a county network, what we're doing with the intrusion detection is a good example. We also end up providing a service for the entire county, which Great, that includes elections, so it meets the mandate of the federal grant. But you know what we're also going to analyze at the same time is whether or not another research project we're doing is undertaking is whether or not is there is it a better model or more cost effective to well let's just isolate the county board of elections and protect them you know put a box or, or a wall around them separately or is it just easier. And cheaper, it's like, well, this protect the whole county, and the election gets covered. We're all happy. Uh, we don't know the answer to that, and that's that's something we're going to look into. Nobody knows the answer to that yet. Yeah, that's what we're we're at the we're at the front edge of that research, trying to figure that out. Well, with your poll books, uh, the intrusion detection, you know, may have some role in that. But what you're talking about is the poll books in the field. They obviously will have to have their own security requirements for how they connect with each other, how they connect with the main database, what's the relationship of, of any data that might move back and forth, 
For example, if you're recording voting history and pulling that off of there, you want to make sure that that's not corrupted in any way when it's being transferred. Uh, you know, that, uh, that transfer of data is an issue we've already identified as a risk among the counties because it's something they already currently do with third-party vendors who presumably a uh, poll book would be a third-party vendor unless they developed it in-house. And they transfer data to printers for the poll books. You know, is that data, are they ensured that that data was transferred correctly? Is there a validation procedure for that? the ballot printer, you want to make sure that that is protected as well. So all of those issues are something that we're, we're going to identify in the risk assessment, but what we have the capability to either regulate for the counties that here's the standard you need to meet, and how much money we can give them to get, to get them to that level. You know, the, the worst situation is you want to set something that they can't ever possibly meet and you give them no resources to do it. So, you know, that's our, one of the fears we have in looking to figure out identifying what the risks are. We're going to see, we're already starting to see that, you know, there are issues that counties, some counties are better than others, and it's not a question of size, and it's not a question of money. There are small counties that run an excellent IT shop, um, but, you know, that's where the county has invested locally, and it, that's it's all. Yeah, and, and they put the effort into it. But, you know, security continues to be an issue. You know, we have seen breaches in three counties this year. Again, they weren't attacking the county board directly, but they were impacted by a breach in the county. Uh, two of our counties are still offline for the voter registration system because they have not met the, the requirements we want them to meet before they reconnect. Again, it wasn't the fault of the county board, it wasn't an attack on the elections, but it had an impact. So, you know, looking at how the county gets protected is, is becoming an issue for, you know, I think the state is starting to see that the state services are being impacted if you don't protect the county as a whole. And we, we were fortunate to get some funding for that, so, you know, we're, we're, uh, the counties will benefit, the county as a whole will benefit from the work we're doing. And, and I think the state, because it's, you know, when we were given this responsibility, this money, and we, you know, Todd and I participated in the governor's task force and many of these other groups, they're like, you're getting this money to protect elections. And they all asked the same kind of question. The first time we went to the legislature, they said, why can't we build a, a, set, a, set, a requirement that their, the voter registration system be separate like the voting machine? And our initial answer was, well, that sounds expensive and would take a long time. Um, now we've done a little bit of research and we find out it would be expensive and take a long time. Um, we are looking, but they all like, keep asking us the same question. One of the things we're doing is working with the Center for Technology in Government to, to come up with a model. What, do, what would five years from now be the ideal place we want to be to protect voter registration system? Um, can we put protections around it and feel confident that it's working or do we have to isolate it? And then what is the cost-benefit analysis of those two options? We need to get that information for, at, a, at a, you know, just in a, in a more uh, reliable way than just our, what are we hearing, what do we think, what are we seeing in a report that we can all, um, you know, come to a conclusion and make recommendations on where do we want to be five years from now. And in the meantime, we're doing the best we can to identify what's broken. Um, there are counties that are better. Nobody is perfect. And certainly in this area, even if you're perfect today, the bad people find a way to break it, and then you have to work tomorrow to stay current. So our the, the $4 million that's left is nowhere near going to cover anything that's on the list. That's why um, not only do we need to make the case, why do we need more money to protect elections, one of the issues is it's harder for us to protect elections the way the infrastructure currently is in place in counties because we're finding it hard to protect elections without protecting counties. And and and, and it's kind of like, you know, why do we have to, you know, why do they sue us to make the school accessible 
other than we picked it as a polling site for election day when we use it two days out of the year. If we um, don't use that school, it would still never get accessible. Um, but they don't sue the school, they sue us because we've decided to use it. Um, same kind of issue here. Um, we have to find a way to make the counties safe for an election infrastructure, but it'll have all these other effects for health department and all the other departments that they have. And, 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 it's, and it's taking more money, and we have to make the case to the government of the state of New York. Uh, it's either all on the counties to do, and then how can we guarantee the elections will be safe, or collectively we need to work together and get more money to do it, you know, whatever pocket you're taking it out of at the state level because we have the resources and the ability to do it in a uniform way that really makes it safe. So I would encourage that whether it's our job, DISH's job, or some other entity in the state of New York, um, it's going to take more money and they should uh, appropriate more so that we can do more of the items on the list. Because when we've met to come up with the, with the work that the risk assessment is doing, which is also an inventory of what is out there. Nobody had an inventory of what was out there. So it made our job harder to do the traditional risk assessment because it's it's really a risk assessment in an inventory. So we, it's a it's a big project. It's a huge project. It's taking a great deal of resources of the extra people we have from the Secure Election Center, a huge amount of effort from Bill Cross and others. And and because we're spending so much and spending so much time on it, we want it to be as valuable value added to the counties as possible and more importantly give us we don't want to just come up with a report and tell them to go make a change to it if it's not going to give us something that we can use to set policy going forward you know um, so those are the perspectives that we're looking at and and it's a lot of money just to get you know what what can we do to keep you know protect as much as we can while we come up with a list of things that need to be fixed and fix them um, and 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 we need more money to make that happen. So we'll make the case. Yeah. Is that the report from Bill? That that summarizes the high level items. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then we'll move on to enforcement. Um, I know that Risa Sugarman is not here. In fact, I think she sent us an email saying she purposely didn't uh, attend today's meeting. Um, and I think her reasoning was the lawsuit that she filed last Friday uh, regarding the implementation of the regulations that the board passed back in August? August 8th. Yes. August, right. Um, I would note that, well, a couple things, I guess, and others want to speak. I would just note there were several reports due to this board based on the regulation from her unit. Um, they were due the end of the year. On a, we, our, our regulation has them coming in on a quarterly basis, and the end of the first quarter would have been December 31st. So I have a list of the report, the total number of complaints received by the unit, total number of hearing officer proceedings initiated, total number of settlements, total number of special proceedings, uh, commenced by the unit, total sum of money collected, total number of deficiency referrals from compliance to them, and the for, and uh, failure to file um, report as well. So there were a number of reports that were due to this board on December 31st pursuant to that regulation. I believe the directors informed her of that a couple weeks ago. I don't see the reports here, so we don't have them. Um, you know, the lawsuit was filed on Friday. There was an effort, as I think Brian mentioned, to have a TRO implemented by the court to uh, prevent us from enforcing our, our, our regulation. That was denied by the court. I, I think pursuant to that denial, that obligation continues by the unit to comply with the regulations. Um, apparently, re, uh, Ms. Sugarman has chosen not to, considering we don't have the, we don't have the reports here, and I don't believe the directors received a copy of the report. So just so you're aware, we do not have 
the uh, reports that were required. And I don't believe the lawsuit, by the mere filing of it, would uh, allow that she no longer has that obligation. I think she does. And, and I understand the TRO was the proper method to try to get relief from that, but the court denied that TRO, and so there was no relief given. So I still think those, uh, those uh, reports are due, and we have not received them. I, I was looking forward to those reports and getting numbers, but I, I couldn't get the numbers, those numbers, because there's no other place to get them. Mm -hmm. So I asked a couple of staff people to just look up subpoenas, criminal referrals, you know, that kind of stuff, and they went through the minutes, so, because we can get, get that through the minutes. She requested, in four and a half years, 48 subpoenas. 40 we granted, 8 we denied. Of those denied, 6 were referred to compliance over the four and a half year period. She requested 18 criminal referrals and all were granted. And the last request we got from her was December 15th, 2017. More than a year ago. More than a year ago. So um, I just wanted to put that in the record so, so that we have it. This is over four and a half years, I think. Um, and not a single criminal referral last year, not a single subpoena request last year. She only brought six hearing officer proceedings. Is it six or five? Six. Six. Um, uh, out of the several thousand referrals that were made to her by the compliance unit, and that there are still how many committees that have not filed at all? Um, the last they, report from from the last report, I believe it was around 2,300 out of the, the 2,500. That. And nothing happens to those 2,300 unless you're one of the six that she chooses to bring a hearing officer proceeding. And, of course, she refuses to disclose what criteria she uses on how to pick those six out of the 2,300. The, the reason I brought these numbers up is because uh, we, we granted almost everything that was asked for in, in this process. There weren't that many things asked for. Um, so I didn't, want, I, I didn't want general public, because I read some of the articles on this, to get an impression that there was anything that we were doing that wasn't assisting her in doing her job. I don't know about the other ones because we don't have the numbers. Um, but I was just, just concerned. Um, well, the unfortunate part is that, you know, obviously she's not present today. And the fact of the matter is if she were present, she wouldn't be presenting us anything anyway, which was the reason we put in some of these regulations. It's all about transparency, not to throw a, a, a curveball or a wrench into her works as to what she's doing as, as far as investigations are concerned, but to say, hey, how many investigations do you have? What have you done? Have you proceeded? The, the list that uh, Commissioner Kaczynski just read off basically says, we'd like some numbers. <laughs> numbers certainly have nothing to do with secrecy, have nothing to do with, with uh, impinging upon any criminal investigations. It's just numbers. We'd like to know what's happening. And I think that the public has the right to know what's happening. And that's all. That's the only reason that these regulations were put in. If she had been, if she had been cooperative from the beginning and, and answering some of the questions that have been asked right here in public, we wouldn't have needed it. However, we tightened things up, haven't hindered her at all. We still have. We still have. She still has to come to us for subpoenas as she did before. Well, that's why I read these numbers. So it's like you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about a pocket full of nothing here. That's correct. Yeah, you know, it's ridiculous. That's correct. It's a sad commentary in my mind. And by the way, you, we, you know, you just alluded to it, but you emphasized that we didn't pass any regulations, and I voted against those things. Remember that? No, you did. Not because I was against them, for other reasons. Uh, that we didn't, we, we allowed over three and a half, almost four years to go by before we did any regulations. And it was just because of what you just mentioned that we went to the regulations. There's no confidentiality being exposed in any of the things we've, we've asked for. And, and we the, haven't ended in any way. And what's her answer to us? I think I'll sue you. <laughs> well, as they say, bring it on. Well, well I just thought that's shame. Just a shame. Well, yeah. uh, I, I just want to follow up by saying uh, 
certainly she has the right to sue us if that's what she wants to do, and we get sued by lots of people all the time. But the fact that she brings a lawsuit does not excuse her from performing her job. Um, and for her to just unilaterally say, I'm not going to come to your meeting because I sued you, uh, uh, does not uh, appear to be appropriate. I wanted to add also that uh, I was disappointed that the Albany Times Union posted her legal papers, um, but did not post the uh, affidavit that our legal staff worked so hard to prepare uh, in opposition to the motion for a temporary restraining order. So, so the the which were the successful papers. which were the success right <laughs> which the court enough. agreed with our papers and right. not with her papers right um, and so for anybody who's interested uh, I would certainly urge them to uh, uh, ask uh, public information or uh, our legal staff for a copy of the papers and we would make them available yes I agree and uh, by the way I would commend the staff I, I for the job they too. did because I, I know they had a very okay. short period of time she filed the suit on Thursday. Our responsive papers were due on Friday. Needless to say, it's an extraordinarily short period of time, but I thought the legal staff did a very good job of composing the papers and outlining the arguments that we have for why those regulations are valid. And I would commend the staff for doing that, and I think the court agreed uh, with that by denying the TRO. So um, I'd just like to make mention of that as well. But I agree with the commissioner um, that, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the legal avenue to avoid doing that would have been the TRO. That was denied. And with the denial, the obligation continues. So the fact that there is no TRO in place um, means you have to co continue to comply with the regulations that are uh, in, in force. borders on insubordination. Well, it, not borders. Um, <laughs> I, I think... I being kind. <laughs> well, but, but it is insubordination that... Uh, the, the temporary restraining order was denied. Even if there were a temporary restraining order, that doesn't uh, give her cause to unilaterally say, I'm not coming to your meeting. Um, coming to the meeting's part of her job, and now she's not doing her job. Do we yep. all agree with that? Certainly. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed because we did, from the last meeting, have some outstanding issues. I know the staff had provided a pretty robust report to us on the last meeting about the uh, status of our failure to file uh, committees. And uh, we had raised it at the meeting, but I believe that uh, Risa had not received the report and wasn't really able to discuss it, but I had indicated we wanted to discuss it at this meeting then, because there'd be adequate time to look it over. Unfortunately, we won't, we won't be able to do that. But I think uh, you know having those kinds of discussions would have been helpful fruitful to get it out there as to what is going on with the failure to file uh, as well as other issues but unfortunately we can't do that today um, so I is there anything else anybody has okay then we will move on to the uh, old business that we have in front of us and the first one is the uh, we have new voter registration forms coming out because of the uh, last election to Parties were dropped, and two parties are being added to the voter reg registration form. So we have to adopt a new voter registration form to reflect that. We also, uh, pursuant to Commissioner Spano's suggestion last meeting, we had a change in the way the independent voter is being uh, presented on the form. There's new language there. I know this was of particular interest to Commissioner Spano. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. To yes, see I if, did. Okay. So that's also a change to the uh, form. So I guess before us today is a request to approve the new form for use going forward in New York State. Of, well, we actually have two. We have a registration form and, and an affidavit. Resolution 1 yeah. is the form for voter registration by mail and the NVRA form. Um, making similar and those are the only two changes is that correct um, since we met last yes no uh, to the form we, we also uh, accommodated the health department had some word changes well, to did. the organ donor and, oh, we, okay. and we had made we presented at the last meeting a slight 
update in the qualifications to register in the top part of the application to, ref to reflect unless parole or pardoned and we added or restored rights of citizenship because of executive order 181 okay. we wanted to make sure we included um, that that couple extra words in both in all of our applications okay I move adoption of both resolutions is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So those two, both the uh, voter rights form and the affidavit envelope form were approved. Okay, that concludes old business. Um, we'll now move on to new business. And our first one is, I know we're short on hearing officers. We're down to two, as I understand it, and we should have five. And I, before us, there is a... Yes, sir, uh, Commissioner. Well, let me just let me just outline it, Bill. There's a there's a request that we appoint three more hearing officers to, and five is the maximum, or is oh, that just can, the number we came up with? Okay, so we've decided five is the optimal number, so this will bring us up to five. Okay. Do we, do we lose any? Well, we this will be the third time since the implementation of the law that the board will be uh, adding hearing officers. We had initial slate people have gone on to different jobs or there's been some health issues and things like that. Uh, that list winnowed down to two. Um, and so because, and, and one of those has a, a potential conflict in one of those people. So uh, as it stands, we want to have a, at least a, an assemblage to pick from. And so uh, this will bring our list to four plus and uh, will allow us to do a random selection for when a hearing officer is requested. I, I think that's appropriate that we have that so that there can be a random assignment even though being a hearing officer for the Board of Elections is like the old Maytag return. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the call. <laughs> you have to be old enough to understand. <laughs> in that category <laughs> <laughs> all right any discussion about the three names that we've been given I move the resolution a second all in favor <laughs> aye. Aye. aye opposed so the three three new hearing officers are approved we'll move on to number two which is the amendment to regulation 6214 which I believe uh, is the uh, contribution limit and who's going to speak to that um, I, I will speak to it, but if there's any detail that needs to be provided, Mr. McCann um, is, is best situated to provide it. Okay. Um, every four years, commissioners, as we discussed briefly at the last meeting, um, by statute, ministerially, we're required to do a calculation based on a particular subset of the um, United States Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index, and then adjust the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the contribution limits, certain contribution limits that are identified uh, by the statute. So since time immemorial, uh, well, actually not that long. Um, since the 1990s, um, the board has every four years adopted a, uh, a resolution to do that. Um, attached in the board's packet um, are the relevant limits uh, that are outlined in 6214 that have to be increased. Um, the computation, which is uh, just shy of 7% um, in terms of the, the four-year increase in the CPI, which is then applied to the prior limit. And then uh, the statute says that we round to the nearest $100 increment. Um, so the resolution before you adopts on an emergency basis the publication of those new limits. Um, and because the statute requires that this work be completed by February 1st. Okay. Any, any further discussion? This is basically a ministerial act. It's yes. completely ministerial. Move the resolution. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so that's, a, that's adopted. And then last is an advisory opinion regarding campaign funds, use of campaign funds. And who wants to speak to that one? I can speak to that. Uh, Commissioner, we received a request uh, from a present office holder who was seeking to challenge the actions of the Committee on Legislative and Executive Compensation, uh, requesting an, an advisory opinion as to whether or not they could appropriately use funds from their campaign committee uh, relative to the legal expenses for such a challenge. Uh, the uh, staff uh, compiled uh, uh, this advisory opinion that outlines the pertinent provisions of 14-130, uh, which is the personal use provision, talks about the applicable subprovisions therein, 
and applying it to uh, the facts uh, provided, uh, determined that it would be an appropriate use of campaign funds as those usage of funds to pay for the legal fees would be directly related to the holding of the public office. And so the determination before you would hold that to be the case. Is there any discussion? Yeah. All in, uh, do I have a motion? Yeah, I move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Everybody agrees. That ends the uh, new business portion of the meeting. And I don't have any other public business to discuss except, I guess, the next uh, board meeting. I would like to have a quick executive session after the board meeting um, to discuss litigation and an enforcement matter. And if that's okay, we'll, we'll do that right after the meeting. But before we leave, I think we should... Um, I don't think we can do an enforcement matter without Risa being present, and she wasn't notified of a, an enforcement item on the agenda. But we can discuss litigation. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, well, we'll we'll discuss it. I don't want to inappropriately discuss something. Okay. Um, let's go um, to next meeting. So uh, we need a next meeting date. We're looking potentially at the last week of February. I don't know how people feel about that. Maybe tough for me, but I can make it with a screen. Probably. Oh, okay. 25 well, or 26? We could do 25, 26. Anybody we'll care? Is that okay? You, okay? You're not going to be here? No, I may be here. Okay. Just, you know. Well, how about, uh, does one date work better than the other? 25, 26? How about, how about 26? Okay. Tuesday the 26th, is that? Mm -hmm. It's okay, right. Okay. So Tuesday the 26th will be the next board meeting. We, we need to have the April... We need to have one by May 1. I with know, the new but can we talk about it in February? Is there a reason we have to do it now, or do you want to? Well, it'd be nice well, to yeah, block yeah, out a date. Out. Okay, fine, um, we can do that too. It's easier for me, because okay. I... Yeah, okay. It's easier for me too. Okay. Um, How about March 19th? Oh, we, we need one somewhere on no. April 29th or April. 30th. Okay. If you want more in between, no, I, that's I perfectly fine. Um, but in, in order for you to make determinations so we can certify any valid issues we have to certify by May 1st on May 1st okay. or not later that so okay. the June primary bill gets signed Assuming. so you're talking the end of April did you want to meet yeah. the 29th or 30th is that what I right okay I can do either day I can do either one How about 29th or 30th of, of April of April oh yeah way into April uh, we can talk about March I can do either February. one yeah, if you want to do it. I don't, um, I don't want to watch it. <laughs> what do you think? Tuesday's April's fine. Yeah, April 29th. Which one? Which Tuesday's one? Tuesday's better, uh, I think. For Tuesday Santa better, 30th better. Actually, 29 is better for me. Well, then let's do 20. I can do 30. Well, let's do 29. If that's uh, better for you, we'll do 29. Thank you. Yep. So April 29th. So, so those are the next two. And, 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 and April 29th. And, and, and I guess my concern is with these regulations or procedures, or whatever we have to do, we may have to have a meeting in March to get those out, and I think we'll, we'll be available if that's necessary we can talk about that in february though can we um pencil that in Fe march yeah if you want to uh, i mean is there a date the it's better for me day. to pencil something okay in. well your date as i understand you have a 60 day window on something regarding uh the transferring i don't know if we'll need a, any action by the board for that that's that's mid march that's like march 20th give or take well 19th Worked with two. I don't yeah, know. If it works with okay, more than so you're talking March 19th. What about the following week? Oh, you're here the 19th. Well, I, that would be easier for me. Okay, March 19th. 19th. Okay. So you know, if, if that would work, we could tentatively we can March 19th. Change. Yeah, we're we can, just going to March 19th. March 19th. We have three meetings. Great. Okay. Okay. So we're good. So that will that conclude today's public meeting. If there's no other business, I would in. Uh, is there is there a uh, motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. So we're adjourned. We will not be coming back into public session. No. Um, we need to vote to go into executive session. We, we did. did okay, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um,